Okay, let's talk about calcium because we've talked we've talked about sodium and potassium. We're really familiar with the renin angiotensin system, and we've talked it, um, in depth about how A and P is totally antagonistic to the renin angiotensin system. We've gone in great detail about all the mechanisms that take place. And when is the renin angiotensin system activated? Decreased blood pressure, and things that go along with that are things like a decrease in uh, plasma osmolality, <clears throat> um, a decreased blood volume, right, which is in turn decreased blood pressure. So what is the effect of A and P? What is the, what, what is the goal? When A and P re is released, what is it trying to do to your body? It does inhibit the mechanisms of the renin angiotensin system because I just that's exactly right. And I just told you it's totally antagonistic to it. So what is the goal? To lower the blood pressure because it's kicked in when your blood pressure is too high. Do I know? No, A and P. Angiotensin is part of the renin angiotensin system. So make sure that you understand that. When, when is this mechanism kicked in? When is this mechanism kicked in? Just to recap also, what is an electrolyte? All right, uh, made up of ions, positively and negatively charged ions, dissociates in water, right? So a non-electrolyte, remember, does not dissociate in water. And it's made of covalently bonded organic molecules. So that's the reason why the whole point of the whole lecture is electrolytes are extremely important to fluid shifts. Because if they dissociate in water, it makes a whole lot more uh, molecules in, in the, in the, that dissociate. If one molecule dissociates into two, that has a lot more leverage than just one molecule, right, when it concerns fluid shifts. Does that make sense to everybody? Um, to also, to recap, we talked about where we find certain ions concerning the intracellular fluids, the extracellular fluids. And remember, the extracellular fluids could be broken down into interstitial fluid and plasma. And so make sure you know, going back to that graph that we looked at on page 997, where do you find what ions? Extracellularly, intracellularly. Pay attention to the cations. Pay attention to the anions. And also protein. Majority of the protein in the plasma, the blood plasma. So pay attention to those things. That's just recapping everything we talked about last lecture. Now we'll end up talking about calcium, and then which we we had talked about calcium a little bit, but we're going to pick up with calcium today, and then we're going to go straight into acid and bases, the buffering systems of our body. <clears throat> so what's the major hormone that affects? calcium levels in our blood. Parathyroid hormone, very good. So when PTH releases, it stimulates osteoclast activity, which in turn moves the calcium out of the bone into the blood. So its whole function is to increase your blood calcium levels. And remember, blood calcium is extremely important because of all the activities we've talked about in earlier slides, blood clotting, um, neuromuscular activity, all those things that we've talked about where calcium is important. So extracellular fluid calcium concentrations are important. Calcium reabsorption also goes hand in hand with phosphate <laughs> excretion. And where do we find the majority of phosphates, if you remember? In, interest, interest, well, intracellular fluids. So that was the major anion. Um, we talked about vitamin D being important to this. Um, vitamin D being the precursor made in the skin activated by the sun. So all three of those are, um, or both of those are important for calcium absorption. <clears throat> so looking at this picture, this is pretty much what we've talked about in a nutshell. What little endocrine gland do we see up here? You're actually looking at the thyroid with the parathyroid glands, here, here, and here. And of course, we know the parathyroid releases 
PTH, parathyroid hormone, to increase our blood calcium levels. Whenever the blood calcium levels get to a certain degree, it in turn inhibits the parathyroid glands from releasing parathyroid hormone. But when parathyroid hormone is released, calcium is going to come out of the bone. Okay, so the bone will release its calcium into the blood, which also stimulates <coughs> um, calcium reabsorption through the kidneys. So we're not we don't want to um, excrete calcium in the filtrate because we're trying to get our blood calcium levels up. And parathyroid hormone also promotes kidney activation of vitamin D. So th this is where vitamin D is actually made valid. Vitamin D is integral in calcium absorption from your food. So in order to maximally be able to absorb the nutrients that we need in our food, remember we have all these other things that we need, vitamins and cofactors. And vitamin D is an important vitamin to the absorption of calcium. All right, so parathyroid hormone is extremely influential to calcium, calcium, calcium into coming into the blood. And we said it comes out of the bone, also stimulates the kidneys to reabsorb it. Remember, um, we had a lot of uh, things that were absorbed in the proximal convoluted tubes, the PCT. We talked about that earlier. And then the distal convoluted tube, remember, was totally under hormonal control. So if we had more calcium to be reabsorbed at this point and we didn't want to get rid of it, there would, it would be reabsorbed here as a result of parathyroid hormone. Um, chloride ion, we talked about that. Where do we find high concentrations of chloride ion? Where was the, where did we find high, co high concentrations of the chloride anion? E, ECS. Sodium and chloride ion are the major ions of the ECS. The major ions of the ICF were potassium and phosphate. Sodium and chloride is ECF. And remember that includes interstitial fluid and plasma. The only ch difference between interstitial, interstitial fluid concentrations and plasma concentrations were proteins. And that's because we have tons of proteins in our blood. <coughs> so this ion is the major ion of the extracellular fluid. It helps to maintain the osmotic pressure of the blood. So remember, um, water and ionic concentrations are extremely important. What's the major important ion when we're talking about water? What, what, where does water follow? Sodium. So sodium is the major one. But chloride ions are also involved in this osmotic pr pressure. 99% of these ions are reabsorbed under normal pH conditions. So if our um, fluid composition is at a normal pH, we're reabsorbing most of our chloride ions. However, when acidosis occurs, acidosis is a situation that occurs if your blood pH does what? Drops. If it goes too low. What is too low for blood pH? Anything below 7.35 is considered acidosis for blood. Now, is 7.3 an acidic value? It's not. If we were in chemistry and they asked you, is this basic or acidic, you would say basic, but slightly basic. Because anything below 7 is considered acidic, right? However, when we're talking about A and P and we're talking about physiological conditions, 7.35 to 7.45 is the parameters for blood. If we go above 7.45, then we, we go alkaline. So that's alkalosis. But if we drop below 7.35, the condition is called acidosis. So that's important to understand. So when acidosis occurs, fewer chloride ions are reabsorbed. So that with that being said, if our blood 
<clears throat> goes too acidic, then we start getting rid of the chloride ions. Do you do you want to know why? Or do you know why? I hope you want to know. Because chloride ion comes together with hydrogen ion to make a strong acid. So the more chloride ion that you have, the more acidic your blood will be. So this is a buffering system. So your kidneys are trying to get rid of chloride ion, and that will alle alleviate the acidic conditions. Does that make sense? Um, other anions have transport maximums and excesses. They're excreted in urine. <clears throat> so they, they also have fine parameters, but chloride ion is a good one to point out because it does affect pH, which is what we're about to talk about. All right, so let's move to acid-base balance. And that's, that's, that'll be the conclusion of this chapter. So we've, the first half, we talked all about electrolytes and how they affect fluid composition. Now let's swap gears and finish up with pH. We know pH is extremely important to our bodies, right? Can anybody in here tell me what two systems are the most important systems in maintaining fluid composition pH? What regulates the pH of our fluids? Very good. He named one. Kidneys, the kidneys, and that would be the renal system. Renal system is extremely important to monitoring pH. What's the other one? I would be I would be thrilled if y'all ever read read the chapter before y'all came on here. It's the control center of many things, but not pH. Respiratory system, the lungs. How? What happens? All right, and I'll give you an example. What happens when you hyperventilate? Changes your pH of your blood, right? So the respiratory system and the renal system, these are extremely important to controlling fluid composition pH. <laughs> All right. pH affects, and why is it so important that pH be maintained? What happens is proteins and enzymes in our body, remember, fall apart. They denature. So if you don't have the appropriate pH, it changes the interactions between the bonds of these proteins and enzymes, and they'll fall apart and they'll denature. So pH is extremely important, and that's why in blood it's got to be 7.35 or 7.45, and actually, intracellular is a little closer to 7. And that's because the, the maximum pH for those enzymes is in those parameters. So it's really, really important. So pH is extremely important. Um, so arterial blood around 7.4. And it's, like I said, it's very fine. Seven, anything below 7.35 is considered acidosis. Anything above 7.45 is alkalosis. Your venous blood and your interstitial fluid is around 7.35. And, of course, intracellular fluid inside the cell about 7.0. <coughs> now, most the hydrogen ions are what causes us to go between acidity and basicity conditions. Hydrogen ions are acidic constituents. The more hydrogen ions that you have present, the more acidic the range will go. <coughs> Phosphoric acid is one of the breakdowns that occur um, that can cause, in the extracellular fluid, that can cause a change in acidity and basicity. Lactic acid, remember when we work out, we get that soreness, that's lactic acid buildup. That can change the pH of our <coughs> fluids. Fatty acids, when fats are broken down, remember in lab when we broke down <coughs> to fatty acids, what happened, how did we know we had broken fat down by lipase? Fiddle red had a color change, and it was because we had released fatty acids, so it changed the pH. So it makes sense when our bodies break them down that we're going to change the pH there as well. So when hydrogen ion is liberated and it comes in contact with CO2, 
it becomes bicarbonate. Um, and this kind of leads us into the bicarbonate buffer system. <laughs> this is a good thing. This is why we had to have some, a certain amount of CO2 in our blood. Y'all remember me telling you, pretty much in the past we've thought, we've thought of CO2 as a, a worthless byproduct, right? In biology, that's kind of what they teach you. You use the oxygen, CO2 is the byproduct, and you breathe it out. But technically, we need a certain amount of CO2 in our blood, and it's because when CO2 comes in contact with these hydrogen ions, it forms bicarbonate, which buffers our blood, keeps the pH where it should be. <coughs> Concentration of hydrogen ions is regulated by, by, different buffer, by three different buffer systems that we're going to talk about. Chemical buffer systems are rapid. That's your first line of defense. Brain stem respiratory centers act within one to three minutes. So in a way, John, what you said, you know, thinking about the brain, there is some merit to what you said because they control the respiratory center. But where the actual, um, the actual exchange occurs is at the lungs, but the brain does control that. Renal mechanisms, um, of course, they are the most potent, but this can take a lot longer. So your first line is your chemical buffer systems, what's in the blood, what's in the fluid that buffers too many hydrogen ions. And then the brain stem that, of course, recognizes that um, there's a problem in the pH of your fluid composition. And then the kidneys, of course, can start working. This, this could take a while, but they can affect pH changes as, changes as well. So how does this work? Strong acids are any acid that completely dissociates in fluid. For example, hydrogen, hydrochloric acid. It dissociates into an H plus and a Cl minus. A hydrogen ion and a chloride ion, right? So that's a strong acid. If that gets in our fluid, that can drastically change our pH pretty quickly. You add a strong acid or a strong base, drastic change. But we have present weak acids and weak bases that don't totally dissociate in water. And that's what the definition of a weak acid and a weak base is. It's one that only partially dissociates. Because of its partial dissociation, it works as a buffer. And so it can take on these hydrogen ions or release them to help control the pH of our body. So they're really, really, really important chemical buffering systems in our body. And to show you what I was kind of explaining, this is a strong acid, and you can see it totally dissociates in water. This is carbonic acid, which is a very weak acid, and it's what we find in our blood because it's part of the bicarbonate buffering system. And you'll see what happens is each one of these carbonic acids dissociate into bicarbonate and hydrogen ion. And so there has to be a certain amount of those in our blood. And if too much acid is um, introduced or hydrogen ions are introduced into our fluids, this H plus can combine with this bicarbonate to make carbonic acid. And it's weak and it doesn't greatly affect the pH. So, but it, it, it keeps this a hydrogen ion from greatly affecting the pH of the fluids. It gets a little sticky if you haven't had a chemistry background. So, but whenever I test you and ask you questions, I'm not going to ask you questions about the chemistry of this. Does that make sense? So you don't have to get caught up in the chemistry of what's happening. All right, now here are the three buffering systems that are important to our bodies, extremely important. I've already mentioned one, the bicarbonate buffer system. Also, we have the phosphate buffer system and the protein buffer system. And keep in mind that a buffer is anything that can help us resist change in pH. So these are buffering systems, very important to our bodies. So these are the three. The bicarbonate buffer system, basically, this is the one that I was talking about that deals with the weak acid, carbonic acid. <clears throat> and this is a result of how much CO2 is in your blood, right? So CO2 can co combine with hydrogen ion, make bicarbonate, and then it can take on another hydrogen ion to make carbonic acid. 
Now, I'm not going to ask you specific questions about what buffers are present on each buffering system, but I feel like I need to give you an overview of how each one works. But I do need you to make sure you understand that the bicarbonate buffer system is the only important buffering system of your extracellular fluids. And remember, the blood needs to be between 7.35 and 7.45. So the bicarbonate buffer system is the one that does this. Now, it is involved in the intracellular fluids, but it is the only one that can actually affect the extracellular fluids. So the bicarbonate buffer system is important to this. And how, this is how it works. Just as I've explained already, uh, bicarbonate can actually take on those hydrogen ions that create acidic, ac the acidic environment and also can form carbonic acid. <clears throat> pH decreases only slightly unless all the available um, bicarbonate is used up. And that's our alkaline reserve. <laughs> the kidneys are responsible for regulating, regulating the bicarbonate um, concentrations. Let's say a strong base is introduced into your fluids. The um, carbonic acid will then dissociate to release hydrogen ions. Remember, hydrogen ions mean what? Acidity. It will lower the pH. So, so the pH will not rise drastically as a, as a result of this buffering system. <laughs> um, and again, um, something to point out. Carbonic acid supply is usually almost limitless because where do we get carbon dioxide? Respiration. And that's subject to the respiratory controls. Um, the phosphate buffering system, the second system, it's, it works almost just like the bicarbonate buffer system. I'm not going to go into detail, any more detail about how it works because I'm, I'm not asking you to know that, the chemistry behind it. But it works similarly. And this buffer system is the one that's important to the intracellular fluids. And it's also an effective buffer in urine and the intracellular fluids. And that makes sense because where, where, where do we find most of the phosphate ion? Intracellular fluids. So this one's important to the ICF. So the other one we talked about was called what? And it, the bicarbonate buffer system was important to the ECF. Remember, it does affect the ICF, but it's the only of the one that affects the ECF. And the last buffer system is the protein buffer system. Intracellular proteins are very plentiful and powerful, powerful. And the reason for this is a protein is made up of what? Do I know? It does have carbo car carbons. It's not a carbohydrate. A protein is a different class of a molecule. What, what makes up proteins? Amino acids. What do you find on an amino acid? An amine group and a carboxylic acid group. So with that being said, the, the C, the, carbo, the, carbox, carbo, the carboxylic acid can give up a hydrogen ion, or the amine group can take on a hydrogen ion. Does that make sense? So the NH2 can take on the NH, uh, hydrogen ion to make NH3, or the C double bonded OH can give up the H. So a protein in itself, because of the way it's made with amino acids, is a buffer. It's a buffering system. <laughs> so basically, what happens? They're called amphoteric because of that. They can be a weak acid and a weak base because of the amine group and the carboxylic acid group. So when the pH rises. <laughs> the um, carboxylic acid will release the hydrogen ion. If the pH falls, which makes means it's too acidic, the NH2 group will take on the hydrogen ion, and it's no longer dissociated, so it changes that acidity. So, that, so do, does that make sense? So when pH is going up, it means it's going too basic. So we're going to release these hydrogen ions to try to buffer that. When it's falling, it's getting too acidic, so the NH2 will take on the hydrogen ions. Now, as you told me, the respiratory and renal systems are extremely important to controlling pH. They're the most important systems to controlling pH. 
They're a little bit slower than these chemical buffer systems. Remember, the renal system, as we were talking earlier, can take hours to days to affect the pH. But they have a greater capacity to change uh, ultimately than the chemical buffer system. Respiratory regulation of hydroneurons um, is really important, of course, because this controls our CO2 levels. CO2 levels, remember, affects the bicarbonate buffer system, so that's really important. So you can see, and this is just showing you, this is that bicarbonate buffer system of the blood. And it shows you there's CO2 and water available. If there's hydrogen ions that need to be taken up, they can be taken up. <coughs> and if the system needs to uh, change the pH the other direction, then it just simply goes the other direction. So during carbon dioxide unloading, the reaction shifts to the left. So if you're putting a lot of this CO2 into your system, you're, gonna, <coughs> you're going to um, become more acidic. Does that make sense? So it will shift to, to this direction. If you lose a bunch of CO2, what's going to happen? It's going to shift this way. So if, it shifts, if, you're, if, you, if it's going out, the whole system shifts that direction, and it's going to raise the pH. So doing CO2 loading, the reaction shifts to the right. <coughs> so alkalosis, meaning the pH rises, depresses the respiratory center. So that means <coughs> if you have, if you, if your blood has, um, if your blood pH has gone up, you experience alkalosis. This is going to cause your respiratory center to be deeper. Um, you're going to breathe less because <coughs> you you're basically um, your depth is going to decrease because you need these hydrogen ions to increase because you're at a basic pH. Does that make sense? So remember, hydrogen ions are acidic. So when you start breathing, <coughs> the respiratory system depresses your breathing. Your hydrogen ions are going to um, be generated, and what that's going to do is cause this to go down. So the that's to alleviate the alkalosis. If the respiratory system impairment causes acid-base imbalances, such as hypoventilation and hyperventilation, this can also cause the pH to um, <coughs> the, this can also cause the pH to go outside of the, the acceptable parameters. Hyperventilation will cause respiratory alkalosis. Why? You're, le you're releasing too much CO2, right? So look back at that equation. Remember, if you get rid of this and it goes out, the whole equation shifts this direction, which is shifting you towards the two, basic the two basic region. If you reach that, you'll reach alkalosis. So when you hyperventilate, it causes respiratory alkalosis, too much loss of CO2. Does that make sense? Sort of? Eli? Hypoventilation means you're getting too much CO2 in the system. Look at the equation. Too much CO2 causes the equation to shift this direction. What does that liberate? Hydrogen ions. If that happens, it causes respiratory acidosis. Too interesting, right? All right. So chemical buffers cannot eliminate excess acids or bases from the body. But your lungs and kidneys can, as Eli pointed out to us, at least for the kidneys. So the lungs eliminate volatile carbonic acid by eliminating CO2. And kidneys eliminate other fixed metabolic acids, such as phosphoric, uric, and lactic acids, and the ketones to prevent what we call metabolic acidosis. So your lungs are involved in controlling respiratory acidosis and alkalosis. And your kidneys are involved in controlling metabolic acidosis and alkalosis. <clears throat> so the most important renal mechanisms, conserving, of course, the bicarbonate. That's extremely important. And excreting bicarbonate as needed. Generating or reabsorbing 
um, one bicarbonate is the same as losing a, a, a hydrogen ion. So that greatly affects the pH. And of course, excreting one of these is the same as generating, as gaining one. The renal regulation of acid-base balance depends totally on the secretion of hydrogen ions. Remember, guys, it is a, this whole talk has everything to do with hydrogen ions. Too many hydrogen ions is going to put us acidic. Not enough is going to put us basic. So it totally depends on the hydrogen ions. So whether or not you're secreting or excreting hydrogen ions has a very important effect on your pH. So it's secreted in the proximal convoluted tubes. Um, the H, the hydrogen ion, comes from carbonic acid um, produced in reactions catalyzed by this enzyme. Guys, I'm not, like I said, I'm not asking you to get caught up in the chemistry. I'm just trying to give you a basic understanding of how this works. Um, Ammonium ion. Remember, in the renal system, we're excreting metabolic products. When we're breaking down amino acids, we're generating lots of ammonium. Um, and that glutamine is an important break, one that we break down. <laughs> Each glutamine that's broken down is going to generate two ammonium ions and two new bicarbonates. This then moves to the blood, and ammonia is excreted in urine. So does that make sense? So when we break down, say we've broken down that one amino acid, we generated two of these. They need to leave, they need to leave and get out of the system in urine. So they're, they're eliminated. But at the same time, we've got bicarbonate that, we've, that we're putting into the blood. Yes, ammonia is a strong base. A very strong base. Ammonia is an extremely strong base. Um, have you ever heard of uh, <coughs> ammonium hydroxide? Strong base. It will just totally dissociate in water. So yes, you're exactly right. When the body is in alkalosis, we're going to secrete bicarbonate. <coughs> that helps us to reclaim any hydrogen ion to, to <coughs> and acidify the blood. So remember, that's what we want to do. We've got to get hydrogen ions in there if our blood becomes too basic. And of course, it's the opposite of the bicarbonate ion reabsorption. Re so even during alkalosis, your nephrons and collecting ducts are excreting fewer of these than they can serve. So it's basically what I'm wanting you to understand here is that <coughs> hydrogen ions are so important to keeping that pH where it's supposed to be and the kidneys, the renal systems, and the respiratory systems are, are involved in that. And so whether or not the uh, renal systems are getting rid of bicarbonate, conserving bicarbonate, getting rid of ammonium, it's just all important to that. I'm not going to ask you specific questions about bicarbonate and ammonium. OK? That's a little bit more in depth of the chemistry. I just cover in a little bit more in depth so you and I know that you understand what's happening. Are you understanding it or are you going to sleep like Eli? All right. So pretty much, let's kind of skip through um, and talk about the differences between respiratory acidosis and alkalosis and metabolic acidosis and alkalosis. So let's start with respiratory. The most important indicator of whether or not we've got adequate respiratory functions are, of course, what? CO2, CO2 pressures. So how much CO2 do you have? Remember hyperventilation, hypoventilation, that can change our CO2 levels. Too much CO2 levels does what? Makes our blood too acidic, makes it too acidic. Not enough CO2 does what? makes it too alkaline. Why? Because remember that equation, you're removing CO2, so it's shifting that whole buffer system. So make sure you kind of understand that, because that's the whole premises behind respiratory acidosis and alkalosis. It's the most common cause of acid-base imbalances, and it's usually due to a decrease in ventilation or gas exchange. So this, this, it's all about the CO2 levels. It's characterized by falling blood pH, and rising carbon dioxide levels. So if you have too much CO2 
in your blood, what is that called? Yep. Respiratory acidosis. Very good. If the CO2 drops too low, what's it going to cause? Respiratory alkalosis. Very good. And like I've told you many times, hyperventilation, hyperventilation, hyperventilation. This can cause this because too much CO2 is released. What do you do to um, relieve that? Breathe in a bag. Very good. You get the CO2 into your system, it's going to lower the pH, get it back down to normal. Let's talk about metabolic acidosis and alkalosis. Any pH imbalance not caused by abnormal CO2 levels. So when we talk, when I ask, if I ask you any questions about respiratory acidosis and alkalosis, it's all about CO2 levels. Okay? Maintaining normal CO2 levels. And remember, if CO2 levels get too high, it's acidosis. If they get too low, okay, very good. So metabolic acidosis and alkalosis is anything that is, doesn't have to do with CO2. It's usually indicated by the bicarbonate levels. <clears throat> what causes metabolic acidosis? Too much alcohol can cause metabolic acidosis. Why? Because it creates a lot of acetic acid. If you lose too much bicarbonate, if you have lots of diarrhea, this can change the pH and cause metabolic problems. Accumulation of lactic acid, shock, ketosis, diabetic crisis, starvation, and kidney failure. All of these can cause metabolic acidosis or alkalosis. Metabolic alkalosis is much less common than the acidosis condition. So it's much more common to get metabolic acidosis. Rising blood, a rising blood pH and bicarbonate can indicate metabolic acidosis. So remember, don't, don't put in your mind that blood, I mean, that blood is linked to any certain one because CO2 is in the blood too, right? It has to do with whether or not our CO2 levels are high or low, whether it's going to be classified as respiratory and everything else is metabolic. Okay? So if our blood, our blood pH rises and our bicarbonate, that is an indicator. If we vomit a lot of acid contents from our stomach or intake of excessive base, it can cause metabolic alkalosis. <laughs> Makes sense that stomach acid is part of how much acid is in our fluid composition, right? So vomiting too much of that can cause alkalosis. If you take too many antacids, that can also. Because what is an antacid? It's a base to neutralize acids. That We take it usually to neutralize the acids. If we take too many of them, we can ch actually change the pH of our blood. So, Blood pH below 7 is going to be, is that acidic or basic? All right, so acidosis is going to depress the central nervous system. It's going to eventually cause death if it's not um, treated. Anything above 7.8 is going to excite the nervous system, cause things like muscle tetany, tetany, which is random muscle contractions, extreme nervousness, convulsions, respiratory arrest, and that is called alkalosis, metabolic alkalosis. If acid base imbalance is due to the malfunction of a physiological buffer system, the other one compensates. Our bodies are awesome at compensating. So if something goes awry with one of the chemical buffer systems, the two other ones are there. Respiratory system attempts to correct metabolic acid base imbalances as well, and the kidneys will attempt to correct respiratory acid base imbalances. In metabolic acidosis, you experience, of course, high hydrogen ion levels. They stimulate the respiratory centers. Rate and depth of breathing are elevated. This, remember, affects um, bicarbonate levels. What is the important thing to remember about respiratory acidosis and alkalosis? Respiratory is totally the CO2. But in metabolic acidosis, you need to understand that respiration can affect it, okay? Because that can be confusing. Here, 
metabolic acidosis, remember, has to do with everything but CO2. So bicarbonate levels can cause metabolic acidosis. As CO2 is eliminated by the respiratory system, the CO2, CO2 will fall below, below normal. <laughs> respiratory, this is talking, and this is talking about compensation for that if, if the renal system were to fail. <laughs> um, and we've talked about breathing, how breathing affects CO2 levels. And a high pH over 7.45 would be considered alkalosis. And again, breathing can affect that. That's how re the respiratory system compensates. Renal compensation, the other direction can occur. Um, again, CO2, and this, when we're talking about CO2 levels, we're talking about respiratory acidosis and alkalosis. Renal compensation can be in indicated by bicarbonate levels. Remember, the mechanism for re the renal system is to control bicarbonate levels. What's the mechanism for the, the respiratory system? What does it control? CO2 levels. Okay, so you're kind of catching on. Respiratory alkalosis exhibits the low CO2 levels, high pH. Renal compensation can help to occur. Uh, can, uh, renal compensation can compensate for respiratory system failure. And of course, this can be indicated by the bicarbonate levels. So those are the difference, major differences between respiratory acidosis and alkalosis and metabolic acidosis and alkalosis. Really, you only have to remember one thing, what? Well, that's good. Hydrogen ions indicate acidosis. And that's true. Too many of them and too little of them is alkalosis. I like that. But to, to distinguish between whether you're in respiratory or metabolic is, or having respiratory or metabolic issues, CO2. That's all you got to remember. That's all you got to remember. Very, very good. So CO2 conditions is what affects whether it's a respiratory situation or a metabolic situation. Because remember, metabolic is everything but CO2. And that's pretty much it. Um, let's talk a little bit about developmental aspects. Infants have proportionally more extracellular fluid than adults until they're about two. Um, their, their urinary system and digestive system at birth is not completely developed. They have to develop these systems. So they have problems and issues with these balances right off the bat. They don't have a, a, a real good residual lung volume. They have a high rate of fluid intake and output. So it's coming in, it's coming out. Anybody that's had a, a newborn knows that. They have a really high metabolic rate, means they have more metabolic waste. Um, they have a lot of insensible water loss. What was insensible water loss? <coughs> Any water loss that doesn't occur through urine, exactly, was insensible water loss. They also have inefficient uh, kidneys during the first month, but most everything that's coming in is coming almost directly out. Then at puberty, sexual differences in body water content arise as males develop and females develop because males, remember, have more muscle mass, which changes the water uh, composition. Remember, it's about 50% females, 60% males. Then as we get old, we look forward to body water decreasing. So on average, I think an, an older male is about 45% water. Um, elders may be unresponsive to thirst clues. They're more at a risk of dehydration. And as always, as we age, things kind of go downhill. So we're just not quite <laughs> as um, good as we once were. Do you have any questions about this chapter? So we can start reproduction, huh?